Audio recording for this meeting has begun. Great. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Dr. Senna. So, Dr. Senna, please go ahead and introduce yourself and get started. So, uh, thanks, Liam, for the introduction. And um, I wanted to just briefly mention um, I'm an associate professor in medicine at the Division of Infectious Diseases at UNC. Uh, in Chapel Hill, and I'm also the Medical and Laboratory Director at the Durham County Department of Public Health. So I'd like to um, briefly review the pathogen, its epidemiology in the United States, clinical manifestations, sequela, treatment, and diagnosis, and then, um, as Lydia already mentioned, we'll review a case at the end with some uh, audience participation. So let's talk about bacteria. So Mycoplasma genitalium is actually one of the smallest genome of any free-living organism. It only has 480 genes, roughly, uh, and there's no cell wall, which uh, is really an important point when we talk about antimicrobial therapy. So it's very similar to other mycoplasma, um, like mycoplasma pneumonia and urea plasma urolyticum. And the immunodominant adhesion protein is this um, MGPA, which contributes to its pathogenesis. And what you can see here in this electron micrograph is the flash-shaped um, organism, and it has this tip corresponding to the adhesion organelle. So it lives primarily on the epithelial cells of the urinary and genital tracts. Um, it has also been identified um, uh, among MSM um, with respect to asymptomatic rectal carriage. And it was originally um, identified um, over 30 years ago. Um, so. Uh, back in 1980s, uh, first identified in two male cases of NGU. So um, despite its early association with NGU, um, only recently has MGEN, um, which I'll uh, continue to use as an abbreviation, um, has only recently gained attention as an emerging sexually transmitted infection. So back in uh, 2006, uh, CDC treatment guidelines, it was only loosely mentioned. Um, as a pathogen, um, there was uh, very little uh, data supporting its adverse health consequences. And that was partly due to the fact that uh, we only had cultures for uh, diagnosis. So since then, there's been uh, better uh, ways to detect the pathogen. And in 2015, um, the CDC treatment guidelines provided an MGEN section under emerging infections. Um, and uh, I'll quote from the treatment guidelines in the absence of validated tests, MGEN should be suspected in cases of persistent or recurrent urethritis and may be considered um, in uh, persistent or recurrent cases of cervicitis and PID. So uh, we are in the process of um, reviewing the treatment guidelines based on um, the literature um, in the past uh, four years. So um, stay tuned, um, and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, even a more robust section on MGEN. OK, so let's talk about the population prevalence. So um, MGEN infection is actually more common than Neisseria gonorrhea, and has a similar prevalence as chlamydia trachomatis in most settings. So um, this figure shows you um, the difference in uh, population prevalence between uh, women and men. So um, based on a, um, a different studies, you can see uh, low-risk populations, and they tend to be defined as a non-SCI clinic population. Um, the um, prevalence of MGEN among women um, has been estimated 1 to 3 percent in low risk as compared to 7 to 14 percent among women in high-risk populations, which is defined as those attending an STI clinic, um, uh, women with urogenital disease, um, patients presenting uh, to family planning clinics, um, as well as um, individuals classified as sex workers. So for men, um, low-risk population prevalence has been estimated at 1 to 3 percent. And very significantly in high-risk populations, um, it's been estimated to be as high as 10 to 41 percent um, among men. So um, we'll tease that out later as far as the syndromes. Okay, so um, what about the clinic prevalence? So um, there were several studies that looked at um, a wide, um, widespread um, distribution of clinics. Um, the first graph actually um, 
came from seven sites which uh, involve family medicine, OBGYN, family planning, public health, and SCI clinics. And you can see um, there that for MGen in female in purple and male in gray, that uh, there's a, a fairly high um, prevalence of about 16 to 17 percent. And you can compare that relative to chlamydia, gonorrhea, and trichomonas. So the second um, figure um, was taken from um, Wheaton Franciscan Laboratory. Um, this is a um, laboratory system in um, uh, southeastern Wisconsin. They uh, serve approximately 125 clinics, and so they have data um, that they analyzed um, for MGen, and you can see um, a little bit different from the first graph, but again, a very high um, proportion of um, or prevalence of MGen in women in purple um, at 11 percent, and men, uh, it looks like that's more like 7 percent relative to the other um, SDIs. So let's talk about the clinical presentations. So um, in women, um, a very significant uh, thing to remember is that um, there can be asymptomatic infection. Um, and what we typically find is that among women with clinical cervicitis, you can find MGen in 10 to 30 percent. Um, it has also been identified in up to 22 percent of women with pelvic inflammatory disease. And um, untreated PID, um, as we all know, can lead to adverse pregnancy outcomes. So in men, um, men are actually more likely to exhibit symptoms of MGen infection, uh, including urethritis. And um, MGen is responsible for 30% for those with persistent or recurrent urethritis um, that fail azithromycin. So um, both of these, um, for both of these sexes, of course, and for uh, men have sex with men, um, especially, uh, we are concerned, of course, about the risk for increased risk for HIV acquisition and transmission from MGenic um, infection. So when patients do experience symptoms, they're very similar to those associated with other uro urogenital infections. So this is uh, illustrated here, um, STI syndromes in women. Um, you can see there's a significant overlap um, among uh, pathogens. So MGen can cause uh, vaginal discharge, cervical discharge, urethral, um, sorry, urethral inflammation or urethritis symptoms in women, and uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, as I, as I already mentioned. Uh, very similar, of course, to um, the same syndromes that we associate with chlamydia and gonorrhea. So what about STI syndromes? in men, um, we also see a significant overlap with other pathogens. So um, MGen can cause um, penile or urethral discharge, symptoms of urethritis. Um, it's a less strong association, but MGen has been associated as well with ep epididymitis. So um, there's been increasing data regarding complications from MGen infections. And this has really um, been a growing field. Um, there's been a strong association um, based on uh, meta-analysis. I'll show you um, some data um, from um, the meta-analysis and association with PID. But it's also been associated with infertility, preterm birth, spontaneous abortion. In men, um, MGen has been associated with complications, including uh, chronic urethritis, um, balanope, um, and that refers to inflammation of both the glands and the foreskin, um, possibly with prostatitis and epididymitis. And um, as I already mentioned, um, there's been some studies predominantly in Africa where they've shown um, a twofold independent increased risk of HIV-1 acquisition among women infected with MGen, and, and that was based on a longitudinal study. So um, this is the meta-analysis that um, I mentioned already. So um, this was a very nice review, um, involved um, a, a actually extensive review of uh, the literature. So in this particular forest plot, um, which um, I'll walk you through, basically involved data from 10 studies. Um, so I don't know if you can see my cursor, but essentially we have the author here. Um, 
on the on this column and then the year published for the studies and then on the x axis what you can see are basically um, um, the odds ratios and you can also see the values there on this column here as well as the weight uh, the how the study was weighted based on a number of individuals that were uh, enrolled so um, what you can see, for example, on the top, you can see that um, the initial study by Lind actually showed a negative association. Um, but then there's a study by um, Jerstrand uh, from 2007 that showed no association. However, um, as you can see, the bars on the right side, um, sorry, the points as well as the uh, confidence intervals on the right side, uh, which you can see here. Um, essentially, there were several that showed a strong association. So the bottom line is, in this meta-analysis of pelvic inflammatory disease, MGEN infection was associated with uh, significantly increased risk of PID with a pooled odds ratio of uh, 2.14. So in other words, uh, women with um, uh, MGEN infection were, um, um, well, were, had a twofold higher risk of pelvic inflammatory disease than women who did not have MGN infection. So um, how about infertility? Um, so again, in the same meta-analysis, um, in this particular case, there are only five studies that look at MGEN um, and infertility. Um, this was based on women presenting to fertility, fertility clinics. Um, they compared um, confirmed tubal factor infertility to other causes um, identified through laparoscopy. So in this meta-analysis, um, you can see, of course, the five studies there and the pooled odds ratio for um, infertility was 2.43. So in other words, uh, women with MGEN infection had a 2.5-fold increased risk of subsequent infertility as uh, determined mainly by laparoscopy. So um, an important point about MGEN is its ability to persist. Um, and these two graphs are actually uh, from two studies that, um, that um, we did uh, through the SCI Clinical Trials Group, which is a NIH-funded um, consortium. So in the first graph, you can see persistence in men. Um, this was a study in which we looked at um, actually um, azithro versus doxy for NGU uh, with or without tinidazole. Um, the main purpose was really to look at the trichomonas, but what we were surprised about is the fact that we saw a lot of MGEN infection. Um, at the time, um, you know, we knew, of course, that MGEN was associated with NGU, but um, this graph actually shows persistence. So despite um, therapy with azithrodoxy, um, you can see at one week um, in the um, dark blue bar, um, there was a significant proportion um, of persistent MGEN infection identified among um, men who had clinical failure, and that was defined as um, persistence of elevated white cells on gram stain, as well as um, symptoms. Um, as compared to those who actually um, had no symptoms at one week. Um, so at three weeks, uh, we saw, um, although a lower proportion of MGEN, we still saw it significantly among individuals with persistent symptoms as compared to those with no symptoms. So in women, um, we also conducted a study. Uh, this was involving women with bacterial vaginosis, 15 to 25 years of age. We collected specimens over 12 months. And so um, this was a, a study where we collected the specimens um, from um, women who uh, shipped them in. Uh, they did self-collected swabs at home. So um, essentially what we saw was that um, there was a 21% uh, rate of persistent MGEN among these asymptomatic women. We did encourage them to come in if they had symptoms, but um, the fact that we saw this high proportion uh, persistent over the full 12 months um, is uh, very concerning due to the uh, issues that are already raised regarding subsequent complications of pelvic inflammatory disease as well as uh, infertility. So let's talk about therapies. So um, 
what we have um, really been concerned about is what therapies are available and effective for MGen infection. So we know that doxycycline for seven days has uh, very poor cure rates, and you can see that here in this nice graph um, of the studies that were conducted uh, that compared doxy versus azithro. So azithro, one gram in a single dose, is the recommended therapy in the 2015 um, CDC-SCD treatment guidelines. However, what we've seen is that there's been a decline in cure rates from 85% 85% to 67% before and after 2009. You can see that in this graph here with um, doxycycline in, in um, black and azithromycin in gray. So um, what's been concerning is this study by Lisa Manhart from 2013 where it actually showed that the cure rate uh, from azithromycin 1 gram is uh, 40%. So what we're seeing here are uh, definitely declining cure rates from azithromycin, uh, probably due to um, a lot of use of azithromycin for uh, urethritis, cervicitis, of course, and for chlamydia treatment. So um, what the Australians uh, were exploring, of course, was whether we needed to increase our azithromycin dose. Um, but they found that azithromycin at 1.5 grams over five days was no more effective than single dose. So uh, this is a, a another meta-analysis, this time of azithromycin curates, um, another forest plot where you can see the studies on the left side um, publication year. Um, and then um, the microbiological curates with 95% confidence intervals. And so you can see on the x-axis on the bottom um, the overall pooled cure rate from azithromycin um, is roughly about 77%. So what about other therapies? Well, moxifloxacin at 400 milligram daily for 7 to 14 days is the preferred second line. Um, this graph here on the right shows that essentially um, it's small print, but you can see there, there's really no difference between uh, 7 days versus 10 days versus 14 days. But what is concerning is this decline in cure rates from 100% um, to 89%. So 100% before 2010, and now we're down to 89% cure rates from moxifloxacin. Um, so again, very concerning for how we're going to treat this pathogen. So the point here is the antimicrobial resistance and the mechanisms that we need to consider. So with azithromycin, um, this is related to the single nucleotide polymorphisms in region 5 of the 23S ribosomal RNA. Um, and uh, this is very similar to other um, bacteria that has developed resistance to azithromycin. So for moxifloxacin, um, this is associated with presence of mutations in gyrase A and PAR C. Um, this is in the quinolone resistance region of MGen, and that has been associated with treatment failures. So overall, macrolide resistance is now reported um, increasingly so, and up to 50% of diagnosed infections in many countries. Um, and there have been concerns about multi-drug resistance in Australia and Japan. So what can we do? I mean, most important thing is to think about how to target therapy. And fortunately, we now have accurate and sensitive tests um, that will uh, be very essential for clinical diagnosis. So how do we diagnose MGENs? So um, we talked about clinical presentations, but um, as you are aware now that there's basically a lot of overlap between uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea infections with MGEN infections. Um, and that is the recommended method of detection. Um, microscopy will not work because the bacteria has no cell wall and gram stain cannot be used. And culture um, doesn't work very well because it's extremely uh, difficult to do and only a few laboratories worldwide have, have successfully cultured MGEN from patient specimens. So um, detection methods um, have really been um, uh, been quite pro uh, productive in development um, over the past um, 20 years. So we've had uh, nucleic acid amplification tests that have been used uh, for research purposes in the past. 
um, early PCR tests, uh, focus on that MPA adhesion gene and the 16S ribosomal RNA gene of the bacteria. And now we have transcription-mediated amplification assays that's um, RNA-based, uh, targets of 23S ribosomal RNA. Um, just so you know, there are uh, multiplex tests that have also um, been developed for detection of multiple pathogens. Um, and um, at some point, they may be available. So uh, fortunately, we now have the first FDA-approved uh, TMA assay for detection of MGen um, in the U.S. by Hologic. And you can see here that um, basically we can use different types of um, specimen um, types uh, using this assay, so clinician-collected and self-collected vaginal swabs, uh, cl clinician-collected and the cervical swabs, female male urine, uh, also male urethral swabs, and self-collected penile medial swabs. So for females, the vaginal swab is the preferred specimen type. You can see the sensitivities and specificities there on the bottom. So a patient-collected vaginal swab, for example, has a 99% uh, sensitivity and 99% specificity. And for males, um, a male urethral swab is the ideal specimen with 98% sensitivity and 90, um, nearly 100% specificity. And Michelle will, will um, talk more about the NATS um, uh, in her portion of the talk. So uh, in summary, there are many things we need to think about, but some of the key questions, um, we do need additional research regarding this pathogen. Um, not just from a basic translational research, but more importantly from a clinical and implementation of like, for example, which patients with specific SDI syndromes should undergo testing for MGen. Um, for example, uh, obviously we need to think about women with cervicitis, persistent NGU, uh, women with pelvic inflammatory disease. Should screening programs be developed from MGen to avoid complications, especially in women? Uh, what should be the recommended first-line treatment for MGen, and are there novel agents in the U.S. that are promising? And in addition to NATS for diagnosis, do we also need molecular-based assays for prediction of antimicrobial resistance in MGen? Okay, so in my last few minutes, I want to go over this case study provided by um, uh, Bill Geisler from University of Alabama at Birmingham. So. Um, the patient is a 21-year-old sexually active uh, female, comes to your office complaining of mild vaginal discharge. You take a history and find that she has three male sexual partners over the past year and that she uses oral contraceptives and condoms for birth control, fortunately. Pelvic exam reveals cervicitis. So how would you manage this patient? More than one answer may be correct. So at this point, I think you're going to have the ability to um, to actually respond. I think we have 30 seconds or less than that at this point. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so uh, the answer here for this first question is all of the above, right? So we obviously want to test a woman with cervicitis with, for chlamydia and gonorrhea, order a trichomonas test, and there is a NATS available. Uh, we should evaluate her for bacterial vaginosis since we, since we know that that can also, some of the pathogens associated with BV can also cause cervicitis. So the answer would be all of the above. Okay, so since the patient has cervicitis, um, I'm going to go through this quickly just so I can um, finish the case study. So since the patient has cervicitis, she prescribed presumptive antibiotic therapy prior to confirmation of infection. You also instruct her to abstain from intercourse until the results of her STI test come back and her recent partners have received impaired treatment. So which antibiotic regimen do you prescribe? Um, more than one answer may be correct. Um, so do you want to prescribe azithro, doxy, or ceftriaxone, or both A and C, both B and C?
Okay, hopefully everyone responded. Okay, this is a long poll. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and give you the response. So it's both A and C. So empiric treatment for chlamydia and gonorrhea, uh, typically we do provide um, both um, azithromycin and ceftriaxone um, for, uh, well, especially in areas where there's higher risk patients, there's a high prevalence of gonorrhea, for example, in, um, in my uh, county, Durham County. So uh, we provide, uh, actually in North Carolina, so we provide um, ceftriaxone and azithro uh, in combination. So um, I'm going to move on. So you administer um, ceftriaxone uh, 250 and give the patient azithromycin. Um, the NAT return positive for chlamydia, but despite tolerating antibiotics, the patient returns in three weeks for, with persistent vaginal discharge. Um, and uh, the pelvic exam also reveals cervicitis. The patient um, reports that she was abstinent and her partner was also treated. So how do you manage this patient? Do you retest for chlamydia, retest for gonorrhea, test for MGen, consider treatment with doxycycline for seven days, or all of the above? This one's a little trickier. Okay, it looks like um, a lot of people want to either treat all of the above or treat for MGen. So the correct answer is all of the above. Um, as I said, this one's a little trickier um, because um, according to Will Geisler, and he is the expert for chlamydia, is that uh, we know that there's some uh, chlamydia treatment failures in women after azithromycin treatment. So um, retesting and treatment with a seven-day course of doxy is reasonable. Um, I definitely agree that retesting for gonorrhea and chlamydia is important, um, as well as MGen, of course, as we already discussed, um, due to the fact that uh, we now have a, an available test. Okay, we're almost there. So the patient does not improve with doxy and the MGen test returns positive, while the chlamydia and gonorrhea tests are negative. So which antibiotic would you now choose to treat resolve the MGen infection. Hopefully you will resolve it. So do you want to repeat doxy, repeat azithro, prescribe moxifloxacin um, at 400 milligrams for 7, 10, or 14 days, or prescribe erythromycin? So, okay. This one should be easy. Okay. Great. So most people are saying prescribe moxifloxacin. So as we already um, discussed, um, moxifloxacin is definitely um, the second line regimen at this point. But as we already stated, um, the concern now is whether or not we have declining cure rates uh, down to 89% with moxifloxacin. So um, as we're finishing the poll, I did want to say that um, for example, um, in Seattle, um, I know that they're considering, and they may have already done this, is to consider, uh, just like the Australians, switching to doxycycline as primary treatment for MGen, um, followed by um, MGen testing. If there was antimicrobial resistance testing available, then that would guide therapy of azithromycin versus moxifloxacin. Um, there are novel um, therapeutic agents that um, hopefully um, We'll uh, have more research that uh, may provide um, as future promising th promising future therapies um, in the in the near um, in, in the next five years. So hopefully we can find alternatives. Um, and clearly that's an important point as we uh, think more about MGen uh, diagnosis and uh, management. 
So I won't go over the summary um, statements. I think we covered it all. Um, and, and at this point, I'd like to go ahead and turn this over to the next speaker, um, Michelle. And uh, we will uh, address questions at the end of um, her presentation. Thank you. For me to go ahead and get started. Yes, please. Thank you so much, Michelle. <laughs> Well, my name is Michelle Pettit, and I am the Senior Lab Scientist with the Springfield Green County Health Department. And these first few slides that we have, I'm going to go ahead and skip through because we've already pretty much covered that. And I'm just going to kind of get to um, what we did here at the Health Department. So um, as you can see, uh, we started our studies in October of 2015, and then we were able to go live because we felt really confident in what we were seeing um, January 4th of 2016. We were able to perform the, the testing done on urine, um, which was the majority of what we were doing, and then, of course, the swabs for the urethra, cervical, and the vaginal. Um, we also started testing um, on the rectals and throats, and that was on our MSM patients. Um, just to give you kind of a background of our clinic and what we do here, uh, we originally started with um, three STD nurses. And we were finding that we were turning away a lot of patients, so we started, decided to start an express clinic, and that is being ran by, our, um, by the laboratory, and we triage our patients, and then we decide if they, due to their symptoms or no symptoms, whether they should go to the nurses or through express. And with adding this, we were able to go from a, seeing about 100 patients a month to now we're seeing over 700 patients a month. So as you can see from um, this slide, we were looking at um, our population for males and females, and um, we are a college town, so of course um, the numbers are very uh, corresponding to what we are seeing there. And then out of that, we wanted to see um, what type of population we were seeing most prevalence in. and. Um, Unfortunately, the highest we were seeing was the unknown because those patients were not uh, identifying of what race they came from. So then we wanted to see where did we see the most positivity rate. And according to this, um, are your, according to this, you were seeing that 40% um, were showing up in the vaginal. So the reason that was so high is because of the fact that um, we had such few samples from that source that the, the positivity rate was high because most of the samples turned up positive. But the majority, like I said earlier, of our testing has always been um, on urines. So then we wanted to look at co-infection rates for with chlamydia, gonorrhea, and of course trichomonas. And it was falling right in line what we were suspecting. Um, um, of course chlamydia was there, then followed by the uh, gonorrhea, and then finally trichomonas. So we had a couple case studies that we wanted to look at, and we wanted to see how many of our past NGU patients um, were possibly positive for mycoplasma genitalium. And so we looked at 51 cases that we had treated for NGU, and out of those, six were positive just for MGen alone. Then four we had co-infections with chlamydia and two with uh, gonorrhea, which was showing us a 23.5% positivity rate, which is pretty high. So then we wanted to look at case studies of reoccurring bacterial vaginosis, and so we took 41 cases, and out of that we had 11 positives just for MGen with a 27% positivity rate, and five of those had no history of any other STDs since they had been coming to us. So this has been an interesting case in that I was saying earlier that we were only testing on throats and rectums on MSMs. So we had a patient come in, 21-year-old female, that had been going in for sore throats to an urgent care and kept getting tested for strep and always turning up negative. She came in our, to our clinic, explained everything that had gone on in all the past history, and so one of our nurses decided to swab her throat and um, see if possibly it was MGen that was present, and sure enough, that's what it was. So because of this case, we decided that if patients came in, female patients came in 
with chronic persistent thro uh, sore throats that we were going to start swabbing them for MGen. The next case study we had that was pretty interesting was on a 32-year-old black male uh, who had been came in for burning with urination. He had had dysuria for five years, but had been with the same partner for eight, had never, ever been tested. And when we uh, tested him with his specimen, he came up positive for MGen. So through all of our studies that we did in the year of 2016, we found that our overall positivity rate is at 10.75%, and that the females, of course, were a little bit higher than men at 12.67 versus 9.18. And again, because of our um, geographics of uh, the students, high uh, college student popul population, our range is from 18 to 34 years of age. And we, we have been just very, very excited that we added the engine onto our STD panel. Um, with this, this kind of shows uh, those graphs that I was showing you earlier of kind of a breakdown of the numbers that we were seeing when we first started doing, um, looking into this as possibly adding an engine on, back onto um, our STD panels. And um, as you can see, we're sitting pretty much with the nation's positivity rate, and um, so we're showing great success in our clinic. And this next slide here, of course, is showing the males to females and the positivity rate and of the co-infections. And again, we're sitting right where we should be sitting with adding the MGen onto our panels. So what we found out is that um, we could, all the different collection sites that we could do for MGen, which is very good, of course, adding a urine onto any of your STD panels is good because of the fact that you will see more men coming in for testing. And we also um, found it was very important how we explained the collection of these specimens, not only um, to the patients, but to other providers that were submitting specimens to us to make sure that we had good valid tests. And that is all that I have, so I am going to turn this back over to Lily. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks so much for that overview. That was really wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and open up our Q&A uh, panel um, for the webinar. Um, on your screen um, shortly, if you don't already, you will see a slide that has a little bit more uh, detailed information of um, specific questions and who to contact. If you have general MGen questions, please feel free to, to, to direct those to Dr. Senna today. Um, we have about the next 15 minutes for questions. Um, and then if you have specific questions for Michelle, please feel free to direct those towards her. Um, and, um, and if there's specific questions about the essay, please um, feel free to email Lynn. Or clinical trial questions, please email Kim. Today we're going to really be focusing on um, those two first question areas, questions for Dr. Senna and questions for Michelle. If you have other questions for Lynn or Kim, please feel free to email those. Um, and today, as I mentioned at the top of the webinar, we are going to be running Q&A through this chat box here. You should see on your screen uh, a Q&A box. And if you, would, if you have any questions, please feel free to start typing them into that chat box. Um, before we get started, one other thing I want to add is that there are, there's a little section underneath the Q&A chat box that says files. Um, throughout the next 15 minutes, feel free to download either of those. The um, APHL MGen fact sheet is there, as well as a few CME uh, details around um, MGen as well. So um, if there are any questions, you can go ahead and open it up. Um, feel free to type your question into the chat box. We will read it aloud and then um, uh, let our speakers respond to them. I see that, that uh, because I think it is the complete information that we'd like to share in the broad trend of the um, um. We have a question okay. here from Matt. How was antimicrobial? testing done for MGen? Do we do antimicrobial testing for RGC 
but it requires a culture and e-testing. Uh, since MDEN doesn't grow well with a culture, I was wondering how this is done. Um, I, Dr. Sena, would you be able to respond to that? Sure. Um, so that is a great question. Um, so what we're um, hoping to have in the near future is a, a molecular-based assay uh, for uh, detection of, for example, um, the gyrase A or the PAR-C mutation, obviously the 23S um, ribosomal RNA. Um, there's two mutations um, that you can detect potentially that way. I know that, for example, the World Health Organization um, has really uh, been working um, towards um, that possibility. There are other tests in development in other countries, um, in particular um, for detection of MGen resistance mutations for antimicrobial susceptibility prediction. Uh, next question is from James. Have you attempted to determine text test of cure? So um, I can try to take that as well, and um, uh, Michelle might have more um, actual experience. So um, I think obviously the test of cure will be um, another NATS test, right? So um, you know, I think. Uh, there's been some studies that um, have probably looked at um, how long um, it would take for MGen to, um, uh, to I guess, be non-viable after treatment. Like, for example, we know that for gonorrhea and chlamydia, roughly, that we can retest at two weeks um, and maybe even as close to seven days after therapy. Um, so I'm not really sure uh, if we have ample data to say when that would be ideal to test for um, MGen following uh, therapy, um, but that will be important, um, you know, as, as we already stated, um, due to the fact that um, our cure rates with azithromycin and amoxie have declined significantly. So can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, it sounded like I got kicked off again. Well, this is Michelle, and what we have done, our protocol here in our clinic is that once they have been treated, they need to wait four weeks to get off the antibiotics, and then they can come back in after three months and be retested if they are not having symptoms. Um, but Michelle, this is Arlene. Just to clarify, um, I think that's for retesting, but I think we're asking just about um, do you have a, a procedure for um, having them return, um, you know, for test of cure? I mean, typically, um, you know, we would obviously ask people with persistent symptoms to come back, at which point we, we could retest them. Yeah, if they're having persistent symptoms after treatment, then they can come back after that four weeks. So in other words, these other clinics. Thank you. So the next question is um, from the Eau Claire City County Health Department, um, and it's really about funding to pay for tests. And Michelle, I was wondering if you could kind of talk about, you know, how you were able to start the project, um, and and maybe speak to a little bit of some of those funding issues that you may have been able to overcome. Um, well, we are unique here in that um, our clinic is totally free uh, along with the treatment and um, our community backs up our testing highly and so we were just able to bring it on board. Um, so as far as the funding, we just found the funds and brought it on because we saw the need. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Um, next question again is for you too, Michelle. It's are you screening all patients for MGen, or do you have criteria? Yes, we do. It's part of the regular panel, and um, we do triage all our patients. So the only time they are not tested for MGen is if they are less than 18 years of age, or if they are pregnant, 
or they are with a partner that is pregnant. Or we also ask them to um, if they want to have the screening. So they do not have to have it if they do not want it. Um, okay, thanks, Michelle. Um, next, next question is from Mia, uh, and she asks, um, it sounds like each community would need to work with their lab to determine prevalence of MGen in our community. Is that how we can decide if she should, if we should, implement MGen testing in our clinic? Um, yeah, I mean, the only way you can find out how prevalent it is in your community is to start testing. Um, I want to add to the, um, the observation, of course, that um, we do have pretty good estimates um, on the MGEM prevalence depending on the um, population, of course, whether they're high risk. Um, obviously, in an SCI clinic setting, uh, we would expect um, there's a fair amount of data that already shows that there's a high prevalence uh, among uh, symptomatic individuals. Uh, the question is, should we also be screening asymptomatic individuals? And I think that would be a little bit harder to implement. Um, I know there's been some concerns about um, cost, um, well, um, well, not just for an SCI clinic, but um, obviously for a laboratory conducting the testing, but I think in general, um, you know, we, we would expect a high prevalence in the SCI clinic population, maybe less so in a family planning clinic or a private clinic. Thank you. Um, Next question is from Rosalyn. Um, is there any concern for cross-reactivity of MGen and M pneumoniae? How you say it? I'm not quite sure. I remember hearing that pharyngeal testing was not would may not be valid given concern for picking up M pneumoniae on the net. That's mycoplasma pneumoniae, but you're close. Um, okay. I think this is a <laughs> I think this is a question maybe for. Um, Lynn Valera from Hologic. Okay, thanks. Um, so, Roslyn, if you wouldn't mind um, emailing your question and any other details surrounding it um, specific to what you're looking for to Lynn, her email is there on the screen. It's lynn.valera at hologic.com, and she um, will respond to you with an answer. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's a great question, Rosalind. So, um, Hopefully, um, we can um, find out more information about that as well. Okay, next question is from Helen. Is there a correlation between MGen and M hominum? So, um, M hominis has actually also been identified, um, you know, historically as a potential cause of urethritis. I'm not sure if there's an exact correlation. Um, between um, those two bacteria. Um, they are in the same class, but we know, for example, um, there's been, um, you know, um, I guess some um, scientific experts that now believe that maybe like urea plasma and M. hominis might be more um, of commensal pathogens in the urethral tract rather than um, true pathogens of urethritis, but I'm not as familiar with the literature. So I'm not sure I could um, definitively answer your question. Thank you so much, Dr. Senna. Um, <clears throat> I don't see any other questions right now in the q and A. I'm going to give everyone another couple of minutes. Oh, here's one from Dave. Just came in. We're seeing costs for MGen testing um, on hologic that are about double of the G, C, and CT. Um, is that what you're seeing? So, um, Dave, unfortunately, we don't really have time to answer that question today. We're really specifically looking for questions for Dr. Senna and Michelle, but I think Lynn um, will probably be able to answer your question. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, you wouldn't mind um, emailing Lynn that specific question and any other details around your question. Um, 
that may help her respond to you, and that would be great. Again, her email is up here on the screen, lynn.valera at hologic.com. Any other questions for Dr. Senna or for Michelle? Please go ahead and type those into the chat box if you do have any other specific questions. So we have that uh, I know the immunology director and uh, I think you went to Capital. Both of them. So this is a good presentation, but I think worth sharing with uh, Um, I don't see any other questions coming in, um, so I just want to go ahead and um, provide you with a little more information about our next webinar. Um, so um, we actually have a save the date for our next MGen Academy webinar, which will be in September, September of this year. Um, we haven't decided on a date quite yet or a time, um, but please be on the lookout for that. Um, it will be um, a follow-on to this webinar. Um, it will be building upon what we've already covered here. Um, and we hope to be able to share a couple more case studies with you um, and talk a little bit more in detail about um, MGen and um, what we're seeing in the field. So that's really what we're going to see for the next webinar uh, of MGen of the MGen Academy. Um, if you have any other questions um, for NCSD, please feel, free, please feel free to email me. And I'm going to actually go ahead and put my email in the chat box here. Um, and um, that is all that we have for today. I want to thank you again for joining us. Um, and for spending the hour with us to learn more about MGen. If, again, if you have any other questions, um, please feel free to email Dr. Senna or Michelle or Lynn if you have specific questions about the MGen assay. Um, and any other clinical trial questions, again, should go to Kim Petro. Um, and if you have any questions about the recording or any of these materials, um, please feel free to email me. And I'm putting my, my information in the chat box now. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.